Um, this morning, we are going to look at one of the single most remarkable invitations in human history, given, of course, by Jesus, and it comes out of Mark chapter 8 in verse 34. Listen to this. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can, it, what can, a, what can a man give in return for his soul? We'll stop our reading right there, but I want you guys to, to really look at verse 35 and consider what's being said here. Jesus says, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. Interestingly enough, this is an invitation to life, to not just existence, but, but to abundant life. It's an invitation to life via death, though. It's, it's no doubt paradox. And so we are going to title the message this morning, The Unlikely Path to Abundant Life. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for just what is Brookview, Lord. Thank you for the, the people that you've they've gathered together, Lord. We invite you into the space this morning, and uh, we just ask that you move amongst us, God. Thank you. Amen. Um, I love carbs, short for carbohydrates. Um, I love them. Anyone else love carbs? Okay. Anyone who didn't raise their hand is a liar. Because, um, I mean, what are we talking about? Carbs, people. We're talking about carbs. Who doesn't love carbs? And the, the thing about carbs are they're good at any time. Have you noticed this? Carbs, they're good at any time. You know, if you're, if you're feeling down, carbs can, carbs can pick you up. If you're, if, you're, if you're feeling jacked, carbs are a great way to, to celebrate. Right? Carbs are good at any time. I mean, any time of the day. In the, in, in the morning, yeah, breakfast. Carbs in the middle of the day, it's called lunch. Carbs at night, is called dinner. Carbs in the middle of the night, yeah, it's called a snack. I mean, carbs are always just amazing. Like, let's just agree, carbs are, are awesome, okay? I am, I am pro-carb. And, you know, I know, like, food gurus or, you know, health doctors say we have to be careful with carbs. I don't want to, okay? I want to be, I want to be reckless with carbs, okay? That's... That's what I want to do. Now, combined with my total obsession for carbs is my equal disinterest in, in working out, okay? I, I love carbs. I don't, I don't like working out. Now, do I work out sometimes? Do I like it? No, absolutely not. Do I like carbs? Yeah, do, you know, do I like it? No, I love it, okay? I love carbs. And <laughs> so, you know, that's kind of just, that's like the balance of my life. I don't like working out, but I love carbs. And so, you know, I've, I've noticed a bit of a trend, though, when it comes to, to working out. And that is, before I work out, I am just, just moaning and groaning. You know, just, just bemoaning at the thought of exerting energy and, 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 and sweating. And, you know, so, so I've noticed a bit, of a bit of a trend here. And, you know, before I work out, I am, I am just hating it. During it, I hate it. After it, though, I love it. I'm just, you're, just, you're just pumped about life. You know what I'm talking about? After you work out, you're just feeling that, like that jack. And so, that's yeah, during it, hate it. Before it, hate it. After it, I love it. Now, I've also noticed a trend with carbs. Before I eat carbs, I love it. I want to I wanna talk about all the different carbs on the table and all the different species and how great they are and how amazing they are. And, and then during the consumption of carbs... I love it even more. I mean, this, this is amazing. But then, almost immediately after the carbs are gone, <laughs> regret and remorse slowly moves in. And we're like, oh, I hate this place. God, we shouldn't have came here. I feel bloated. Did that have gluten in it? Oh. Right? Like, but it's so true. And this is true with, like, so many things in life, right? Like, what... What you really want oftentimes isn't realized until you do what you really don't want to do when you really don't want to do it. And then you're like, I feel amazing. I actually worked out. Isn't that weird? Life is, big word, paradoxical. It really is. 
Which brings us to maybe the single most important and amazing invitation in human history. This is an invitation Jesus is giving humanity. No doubt the, the predominantly Jewish audience that he's speaking to, but, but also to every person who will ever read his word. Jesus gives an invitation, and the invitation is to life, by the way. It's, it's not just to existence, but, but, but to, truly, to truly living. And Jesus, he says, if, if you want to find life, that's an interesting thing to say to people who are clearly breathing, who are clearly existing. He says, if you want to find life, Jesus is saying, some people, they, they breathe, but they don't find life. He says, if you want to find life, but, but listen to how he invites us. He says, he says, come after me, come follow me. Whoever loses his life will find life. What? This is an invitation to life. Keep in mind before we go any further that God is for life. God is for your life. God is for the abundant life. John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. God is for your soul. God is for life. God is for your life. He wants you to have meaning and purpose and fulfillment and satisfaction. And this, this is the invitation to such an existence. But it's paradoxical. This is an invitation to life via death. What? Jesus says, if you're interested in me, if you're enamored with me, if you want to come after me, if you want to follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And then he goes on to further explain whoever tries to hoard his life, try and live life for yourself, obsessed with self, you actually, you'll, you'll lose life. But whoever loses his life because of me and because of the good news that I bring, you'll actually discover what it means to be alive inside and out. I think so much of what Jesus is actually communicating here is getting our eyes off of ourselves, denying ourselves, living our life for his sake and for the gospels, and he's saying that's when we truly start living. But when it comes to the teachings of, of Jesus, such as deny yourself, this is something that can't really be done, it can't really be faked, it can't really, it can't really be done half-heartedly. You know, we, we see this and we think, okay, I need, to, I need to deny myself. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to deny myself because, you know, Jesus, this is an invitation to life, and, and, you know, he says, come follow me to d d deny yourself, so this, this year I'm going to be about self-denial. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live selfless this year. But if we are denying ourselves only for ourselves, only with ourselves in mind, only to help better ourselves, well, that's not denying yourself at all. If we are going to truly deny ourselves, then denying yourself can only be done when we become preoccupied and consumed with someone else. If denying yourself is being consumed with yourself, we have a problem. But we can learn to deny ourselves when we become preoccupied and consumed with someone else. Hence the way Jesus said his invitation. He said, if you want to come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. It's framed there by me. Me is not me, and me is not you. Me is him. He said, if you're interested in me, if you want to roll with me, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. The key to this incredible invitation is bookend by Jesus. When we become preoccupied and consumed with him, what, end, what ends up happening is we lose sight of what we want, when we want it, and how we want it. He says, he says, he who tries to hoard his life or keep his life ends up losing his life. Like, like trying to grasp the air. We're trying to, to get what we want and get what we deserve and get stuff and I want this, I want this. He says, what will end up happening, ironically, is you lose satisfaction, fulfillment, and meaning. But Jesus said, whoever loses his life, notice why we lose our life. He said, for my sake and for the gospels. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying whoever loses his life in, in light of me and my goodness and my love and my mercy loses his life in light of me and the good news that I bring, my story, will actually recover their life, will find meaning 
and purpose and satisfaction. We lose our life, why? Because losing your life is noble and admirable and good and you should be disciplined people. Er, wrong. Wrong answer. We lose our life because we forget. In light of remembering and rehearsing and revisiting, recounting Jesus and all that he's done, done for us, done for me, done for you, all that he's accomplished and, and a transformation begins to take place, our heart starts to look a little bit more like his heart and then we just start denying ourselves. We don't even have to think about it. It just kind of, just kind of happens. There's a verse in, in Matthew chapter 5 that I think is a beautiful picture of what God intends our lives to look like. And I think this is what happens when we, we, when we choose to accept this invitation. Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. We are intended to be vessels of light to our world. So we, we are the light of the world. But, but when we choose our own path, when we choose to not deny ourselves, it's like, it's like taking a lamp and putting it under a bowl. But when we choose yes to this invitation, to this invitation when we deny ourselves, instead we put the lamp on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they might see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. It's pretty powerful. He says, you are the light of the world. I think the goal of, of serving Jesus is being a light right now where you are. Being a light right now. But oftentimes, the problem is, you know, so many people, so many Christians we don't think we have what it takes to make an impact. We live in a culture that puts a lot of, a lot of value, a lot of validation on, on labels. So if you have this much money, or you have this much training, and you have this much education, well then you get a label that says you can do a lot. But Jesus came along and completely deconstructed that type of society. He said, he said no matter what you have, no matter where you've been, no matter how great your background is, no matter what side of the tracks you were born on, if you have me, if I walk with you and you walk with me, then you have the right to be, you have the right to be an influence. You have the right to be a light to the world. And that's the beauty of this invitation. He says, if, if you lose light of yourself, he's, he's not saying lose sight of goals, lose sight of passions, lose sight of aspirations, but, but what happens is when you deny yourself, you no longer look at your passions and gifts and how they can serve you and how they can benefit you, but rather how you can take the gifts and the passions that God has given you and use them to be a light to the world. He says, and that's when you truly start living. It's not about how much training you've had. It's not about how educated you are. I mean, of course, all that stuff helps and it's, it's awesome. But I think the main thing is how available you, you are to be used right now. I heard a story about a police officer who said because he was a police officer, he felt called to support the ministry. But then he, he heard a particular message that, that opened his eyes to, to say, no, as a police officer, I am the ministry. He said, I found out God wanted to use me right now where I am. And so I started to do something a little different. He said, when, when I used to arrest people, I would, I would pray for them silently as I drove them to the station. And then, you know, I, I, just, I just couldn't wait to get them in front of someone who could, who could make a difference, like a, like a minister, like a pastor. And then he said, but, but then I got the sense that God wants to use me right now as a cop. And so what I started doing is, when I arrested someone and put them in the back seat, as we drove to the station, I would just hold up sermons on my phone. He said, he said cause, cause where are they gonna go? He, would, he said, I would, just, I would play music videos, I would play sermons. He said, sometimes people would start to cry, sometimes they would get saved, and he said, sometimes people would end up going to jail, and then they would come back out and track me down and say, are you the police officer that played that sermon? Who is this God that you're talking about? I mean, what a revelation to get that God is not waiting to use you. He wants to use you right now. He told a bunch of regular folks, you are the light of the world right now. I pray that, that, the, that the experience of Jesus will change the expression of love 
that you have to the world. 1 John chapter 4 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one, his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but whoever loves, whoever loves, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. If we have experienced this love, then the, then the expression of love coming out of us should be as passionate as the love that we felt. And we actually get an amazing example of this in, in what is known as the early church. Um, after the, the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, God started what he had always intended to start, and that was a community. And the book of Acts records for us the very first church, the, the very first community of Jesus followers who, who gathered together. There was, there was singing, there was worship, there was, there was food, there was preaching, there was teaching. That's how this has all happened, by the way. We are an extension of the very first church. Now, this, this community is now brand new, okay? Um, it started with 3,000 people in one day. 3,000 people got you know, saved, they met Jesus, and then um, you know, when we pick up the story, there's probably about 6,000 of them. This is Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. Listen to, what, listen to what it says about these thousands of people. And they devoted themselves to the, to the apostles' teachings. They, they wanted to hang out. Fellowship is an ancient English word. That's pretty much what that means. They're, they're hanging out. They're enjoying, they're enjoying each other, you know, fellowship and socializing. They were eating carbs. This is good news. <laughs> eating carbs. They're breaking bread and they're, and they're praying together. Going on, it says, and awe came upon every soul. What's the word awe mean? It means that everyone got a sense that God is awesome. It means that everybody out of 6,000 people in this very first church got a sense that, that God, that, he has a, that they had a profound consciousness of God's presence and reality amongst them. Like he was real. This wasn't custom. This wasn't religion. This wasn't this wasn't tradition. It was God living and breathing among them. He was real. He was just as real to them as anything else on the planet. And all came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And listen to this. Just spontaneously, they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as anyone had need. Now, you will not find any teachings of Peter or any of the other church leaders, community leaders that were telling this, this brand new 6,000 6, Jesus followers to sell their stuff. This was, this was a spontaneous and organic just sense that we need to take care of each other. I'll sell this. I'll sell that. I'll sell the lot I was going to build my vacation home on. We got to make sure that everyone's taken care of. What's happening? Oh, they're denying themselves. Why? Oh, because Peter did a six-week series on denying yourself, so everyone's just pumped about, no. Everyone's just really aware of Jesus. You can see the expression of love that's coming out of these people. Verse 46 says, And day by day they were getting together. That's what that means. Day by day they're, they're gathering together. They're eating more carbs. I love this church eating more carbs, and they ate their food with glad and generous hearts. You gotta love these people. They're, they're getting together every day. They're not isolating themselves. They're eating bread a lot. <laughs> and they're glad, and they're generous in their heart. These people are laughing. These people are excited about life. These people are pumped and happy. Now, you, you may not know this, but historically, it's not because they're under some amazing government where, you know, there, there's low taxes. It's not because there's not evil dictators. They are living in unsettling times in this, ancient, in this ancient day. Economically, governmentally, socially, these are unsettling times. And yet, you've got 6,000 people who seem incredibly content, who seem incredibly pumped and thrilled about life and motivated to give stuff away and be generous to the core. 
what's going on with these people? They're denying themselves. Why? They just have kind of lost sight of themselves, haven't they? And I love the next verse, verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. They just, they just got favor. Wherever they go, they got favor. Favor with their boss, favor with their coworkers, favor with their neighbors. There's, there's favor. And, you know, even if they're not favored, even, I mean, even if things don't work out, they just kind of end up working out. And they, they, just, they just got favor. And it says, and going on, it says, God was adding to their numbers every single day. Well, I bet so. Everybody else is grumpy and has road rage except these people. These people are walking around whistling and skipping. Right? Like, they're walking around just, God's real. God's big. Living beyond ourselves, serving each other, serving our city. And what are they? Happy? Satisfied? Content? It says, day by day, they were adding to the numbers. What I love about this is, it's pretty clear that this wasn't just the, the teachers and the preachers that were making a difference. This was an organic just movement by the whole church to love their city, to love people. These people were not waiting around to be used. They were in the streets. They were in their community. And you'll notice, it wasn't just, they weren't just doing this because it looks good. They weren't just doing it because it's the right thing to do. These people, this was just, this was just the natural response from just denying themselves. You know, what, what can I do to help? I'll, I'll sell this. I'll sell that. Just live and beyond ourselves. And boy, were they happy. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. He said, let your light shine before others that they may see the good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. He didn't say, let your light shine when it's ready and when it's perfectly developed. He said, you are the light of the world right now. Let your light shine right now. God wants to use you right now where you are? What if you woke up every single day saying, somebody is going to end up in my world today. Somebody's going to cross my path, and when they do, I will not miss it. I will not miss out on that chance. What if that's how we woke up each morning? I read about this early church, and it just, it sounds so good, doesn't it? And, and what gets me so just excited and pumped is I see these qualities in our community. I can see so many similarities between our church and this early church, and I just can't wait to see what God has in store for us down the road in our community, on our streets, in other countries, in Haiti. And this is how we do it. But we also have to, have to be prepared that this path to abundant life, this, this life of denying ourselves, it can be tough. It comes with its challenges. Maybe it means missing out on an opportunity. Maybe it means having a few less luxuries than, than that family. Maybe it means going outside your comfort zone. Maybe it means you know, risking what people might, might think of you. Regardless of what it might be, though, we have, to, we have to understand that God is right there with us. Through the highs and the lows, he's right there with us, and he will never leave you, ever. Now, a problem comes up in Acts chapter 7, and that is that the church is growing so much, and they're, so many people are coming that some of the, some of the widows are being neglected in the, the distribution of the food. And the church leaders, community leaders, they don't have time to, to fix this. So they appoint seven dudes who are going to be good with details. They're going to be administrators. They're going to they're gonna help, help people, make sure things don't get, get overlooked. One of the seven dudes, an administrator, um, he's, he's not a platform guy. He, he, he doesn't do any preaching or teaching that we know of, but, but Stephen was... He was good with details. Stephen loved people. His name, as I said, is Stephen, and Stephen loved, loved Jesus. Stephen's one of these guys who's just generous to the core, giving stuff away, no doubt. He's probably sold a few things. And Stephen, one day, he starts telling the story of Jesus, the story of God sending his son to the world and his life and how his life was changed, and he starts telling it to the, to, to the wrong people who don't want to hear what he has to say. They're actually basically gang members extreme religious leaders who are killing Jesus' followers. At the time, they were called people of the way, Christians as we know them today. But, but back then, they weren't called Christians, people of the way, Jesus' followers. They were killing, stoning, not just men, women and children. Stephen gets caught in, in one of these moments, and, 
And uh, he's telling the Jesus story, and, and it goes in, in 754, it says, Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at Stephen because he was telling the Jesus story. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And Stephen, just overwhelmed in this moment of, of, of see, actually seeing God, he, he just opened his mouth and said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Oh, they, they didn't want to hear that said, now, now when they heard these things, they were, they were enraged in the, wrong verse. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and then they began to stone him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man, a young gang member named Saul, who would later encounter Jesus, be renamed Paul and write two-thirds of the New Testament. But at the moment, he's killing Jesus followers. One of which is Stephen. Good man. Stephen's there. Rocks are being thrown at his skull. He's, he's moments from death. He's moments from death. He cries out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then wouldn't you know it, with his last breath, with his last breath, his moments from death, he says, these are his last words. Lord, do not hold this sin against these men. And with that, he died. Who does that sound like? Jesus. Seven things Jesus said while pinned to a tree on the cross. One of the, one of the most profound of the seven things was, was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I've heard that so many times and I thought, well, that's what makes him God. Because if I was up on a, on a cross, it's not what I would say. I wouldn't say, Father, forgive them. I'd say, Father, get them. And get them good. <laughs> and let me watch. Right? I always thought, well, that's what makes him God. Stephen's just a volunteer staff member in the community who's, who's good with details. But boy, he looks a lot like Jesus, doesn't he? Stephen, Jesus, Jesus was pretty real to this young man, Stephen, wasn't he? So much so, I want you to think about how far Stephen has gone in, in living beyond himself. <laughs> he is so preoccupied with the reality of Jesus and his heart for hurting humanity that, that he prays for the people who are who are executing him. He used his last breath to pray for them. Now, what I want to do here is I want to cut the scene and I want to have a retake and I want to be the one writing the lines because, because Stephen, this is not good because it makes all of us normal guys look really bad. Because when I see someone in the HOV lane and there's only one of them, I dial 1844 HERO. <laughs> Why? Because I want justice. That's my problem. Excuse me, sir. Um, I was in line. I know, this is, uh, I know this is the gap, but uh, I'm trying to buy a sweater. Get behind me, cutter. He's a cutter. He cut, he's a cutter, guys. Store manager, he's a cutter. Take care of him. <laughs> Serves him right. I mean, who is this Stephen guy? He is so forgotten about himself. Like, like I just want Stephen, bro, what are you doing? These are the guys killing you. Here, let's, let's rewrite the lines, okay? How about, how about this? These, these are your last words. God, may your angels come. Send them now with blazing swords and cut the heads off these horrible men and let their heads roll like the rocks they throw. Right? Hey, that sounds pretty poetic. <laughs> I like it. So that, that's what I would say, but not Stephen. Stephen. Not Stephen, with, with his last painful breath, so similar to Jesus. He said, Jesus, I'll, God, I'll see you in a minute. But one last prayer on this planet, I will pray. And I'll pray for the men who are murdering me. Make sure you forgive them. Make sure you don't hold this against them. I read that, and I'm like, what happened in this guy's heart? I am so far from this guy's heart. But God, if you can do it in Stephen, do it in me. Like, I, I want to live so beyond myself that I think about the well-being of the people who are hurting me. It's one thing to live beyond yourself for people who've only done you good. But Stephen has gone so far in the preoccupation of Jesus and his heart for humanity that at the hands of one of the great injustices of the entire book of Acts, he prays for the evil men. 
something extraordinary happens here, and there's so much dialogue and discussion, you know, between, you know, scholars and, and Bible commentaries. If you notice, Stephen says, I see, the, I see the glory of God and I see the Son of Man, that is to say Jesus standing at the right hand of God. You will notice throughout the biblical narrative, Jesus is always said to be seated, seated at the right hand of God. His posture is indicative of his power. His authority rules and reigns. A king does not stand at his throne. A king sits on his throne, and he sits because he has no reason to stand. His authority rules and reigns. Jesus' work on the cross was finished. His work was, his work was done. Jesus is always said to be seated at the throne, not here. Stephen says, I see Jesus standing at his throne. How often would his king stand at his throne? Why would a king stand at his throne? To show, to show honor? to show care, to show love, to show adamant interest? How often would a king stand at his throne? Rarely, rarely, friends, oftentimes it was when another king or someone of royalty was present. Stephen says, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. That's right, Stephen, he's standing for you. That's right, Stephen, he's proud of you. That's right, Stephen, he's intimately involved with your life. Your life is precious and your death is precious, Stephen. Don't be fooled. Understand the passion of your God. God is not seated in some distant cosmic throne, like worrying about his own things, you know, concerned with his own issues. No, he stands and he honors you and he's intimately involved with your life. He feels the pain that you feel. He feels the loss you feel. Jesus stood that day and allowed Stephen to see him standing so that Stephen would be a representation of all of those who are loved by God. To know that in your life and in your death, Jesus cares. He's not, he's not reclining back into his throne, you know, just, just, and you're just another number. You're just one of seven billion people on the planet. No, he knows your name. He knows the hairs on your head and you matter to him. He takes the same care and concern with you as he does with every other person on this planet. And when you live in light of such an involved God, it puts, it puts moments on this earth on their proper, in their proper perspective. When we live in light of a God who, who stands on our behalf, who will fight our battles, who will hear our prayers. When you pray, God, how am I going to pay the bills? He does not sit back in his throne thinking, what's that to me? He stands to answer your prayers, to minister to you, to, to love you. Stephen, how did you? Because Jesus was real to him, wasn't he? Wasn't he? I look at that and I go, God, help us to be a community like that. Help us to, to, be so, to live so beyond ourselves, to be so preoccupied with you that, that, we, that we pray for, for the people who are hurting us. What would happen if, if we got our eyes off of ourselves and instead got them on God, who loves you and who's for you and who serves you? Just think about, think about hurting humanity that God has given us the consciousness, the consciousness of, the, the awareness of, and how we can serve them and love them and be a light to them and aid them. And true to form, the very same way that Jesus, the very same way this, the first church experienced gladness and, and joy and, and generosity and simplicity and joy. Guys, we, you and I can experience the same. 